Okay, we'll get started. I have one more on the list coming, but we'll get things rocking and rolling here. Uh, my name is Mike Stegman. I'm the director of the County Conservation Board here. Um, if you've not been out here before, welcome. Um, if you've not been to any of our other areas, please do some exploration. Uh, we have 31 areas that we manage and maintain throughout the county, uh, from the Grimes Farm here to Green Castle. Uh, maybe you've been down there where we have a bison and the swans and the, and the small lake, Sand Lake, Grammar Grove, Timmins Grove. All those areas are, are ours and we manage for the public use. So uh, take advantage of those if you don't know where they're at. On the way out, grab a uh, county map that highlights all of those areas and uh, what they're all about, whether they're uh, campgrounds, uh, picnic areas, wild areas, undeveloped natural areas with trails or no trails. So uh, again, please take advantage of those. Uh, what we're going to do today is build some nest boxes for common bird species. Um, these are uh, cavity nesting birds, uh, and they're actually secondary cavity nesting birds, which means they don't excavate their own hole in a tree. Woodpeckers are the ones that primarily do that, and then next year the woodpeckers will make another hole in a different tree or different branch, and then uh, these guys will claim home uh, to the old woodpecker holes. And what we're doing is simulating that natural cavity in a tree branch or hollow tree or old snag. And we're also providing a safe place for the birds to nest. So uh, in a tree with the holes, um, it's, they're highly susceptible to predation. Um, there's a lot of nests that are lost and when we're, when we're providing a home for them, we want to try and predator proof it all the way from uh, uh, raccoons, snakes, mink, cats, things like that. So when you take these home and mount them, try to put them in a place where cats, uh, primarily, unless you're in a rural area, you can put them on a fence post up high that has a predator guard around it that will prevent a snake from climbing up the, the, the hole or the tree or the, or the uh, you know, they do a lot of damage. Um, uh, same thing with raccoons or cats so that they can't climb up and reach around. Uh, or like on a fence post, you'd, you'd wrap the whole post in, in aluminum flashing so that they wouldn't have a, uh, anything to grab hold to. It would be very slick and they wouldn't be able to climb up the post. So try to predator proof it if at all possible. Um, you can get a U-bolt and put them on a piece of, uh, of old galvanized pipe. Try to get it up about six foot high. Um, again, otherwise what you're doing is just inviting supper for one of those predators. And again, we're trying to provide a safe place uh, for the birds to nest. Do they need these? Um, they have helped in the past with population restoration on species like bluebirds, wood ducks. Um, uh, wood ducks were on the, on the brink of extinction uh, a little over 100 years ago. And in that short period of time, along with habitat reconstruction and leaving those old snags up and, and uh, don't cut, not cutting them down, um, along with the constructions of, of literally thousands of wood duck nest boxes, that, that species has made such a tremendous rebound uh, that they're actually number two in the harvest uh, for, for duck hunters east of the Mississippi River, uh, only surpassed by mallards. So wood ducks are an incredibly common species now. Um, we've, we manage and maintain about 250 of these uh, throughout the county parks up and down the Iowa River system. Uh, we just acquired a new 319 acre area and we're kind of anxious to get out there uh, now that next week looks like the weather, weather is settling down a little bit, we'll be able to get out and, and put those new ones up and then check last year's use. Um, this time of year is when you want to build these boxes, put them up, and if you have any old ones, go clean them out from previous years, nesting. And what you want to do, uh, again, this time of year, we're, we're, the birds are in reproduction mode. I mean, it's spring. Um, the chickadees at my bird feeder this morning were singing. Uh, and that's actually the first time I'd heard them do their, their spring calls. Um, so the daylight hours are getting longer. They're looking for, for places to nest. Um, same thing with the bluebirds. Most of the bluebirds migrated south for the winter. There still are a few around. Um, I can take you out east of town and show you uh, some bluebirds right now uh, along the little creek close to where I live. Same thing with robins. Um, not all robins, you know, once they have open water and a food source, it might be crab apples sitting on a tree. They can live throughout the winter in the cold temperatures. Uh, but again, right now is the time to build these, put them up. So when we do have that spring thaw, the birds migrate back, they're ready to go. Um, also, when you're checking your nest boxes from last year, um, you might have an old nest of a bird in there or mice may have moved in there to spend the winter time. 
clean it out. You don't need to put any materials in them for the birds that we're targeting today. They bring all of their own nest material in. And birds can be identified not only by sight, but by sound. The calls they make are all different. And then the nests that they make and the eggs that they lay, they're all different. They can all be identified. So we don't have to see a bird to identify and know what's been around. And in the case of what we're targeting, um, and what you guys signed up for either bluebirds or wrens, uh, bluebird nests look like a robin nest with no mud. It's all that fine old grass, like out of your yard, bluegrass out of your yard. And their eggs look similar to robin eggs, a little bit more pale or blue. Um, house wrens will use sticks of all the same size and they will fill your house up and then right at the very top of it there'll be a little cup of finer grasses that where they, they'll lay their eggs. And, and there's a lot of behavior associated with each species too. The wood duck boxes, just because you have a, a wren house with a hole the size just big enough for a wren to fit in and, and not a starling or a wood duck or a great crested flycatcher, those are all cavity nesting birds. Um, if they find a cavity that meets their requirements, they'll, they'll use it. And we've had numerous occasions, in, in fact, half the wood duck boxes that we have that have had wood duck nests in them, wrens will claim those later in the year and fill this whole thing up with sticks so that they'll go in and all the way back in the back corner there'll be this little cup where the wrens have nested. So a lot of behavior to, to each species. Um, some of the species, and again, for again site identification, um, well, let me go back to, to the, the, the nest descriptions. And we've, we've got some books in the library that show every, their photo, it's a field guide for bird nests. So it shows each style of nest and each egg uh, that the birds lay. Um, so we got bluebirds, uh, house wrens, and then house sparrows. Um, house sparrows are an invasive species, just like European starlings. They're bad, very bad. Um, I encourage you, if you do have one of these nests uh, started in your house, uh, tear it out. Um, those are the two species in North America that are not protected by law. Um, if you have the heart and can do it, kill them, destroy the eggs, destroy the babies. Um, because what they do is they will take, they've actually had detrimental effects to the bluebird populations. Uh, if if a, a bluebird takes up residence in a box or a tree cavity, um, uh, house sparrows and European starlings will actually go in and kill the bluebirds, run them off. So that's a, a very high competition for nest sites. Um, so the two species, the house sparrows, and which is actually not a sparrow, it's a weaver finch, um, introduced from Europe um, 150, 200 years ago, uh, made its way, populated its way across North America. So they're typically the species you'll see in towns. And that's one reason um, if you do live in town and chose to build a wren house, the holes are too small to allow sparrows in. So you're targeting wrens, which have a beautiful little song uh, in the spring. I remember when I was a kid, we had a house in a raspberry patch, and I'd always wait for the wrens to come back and start singing because that signified to me, you know, robins singing, but then wrens, okay, it's summertime now. Um, but uh, not only will you get potential in your wren house, your wrens, chickadees are also small enough to fit in there. And their nest, I don't have an example of it here, but their nest, again, is, is a layer, it's, it's like three layers. You have a layer of, of fine grass, and then you have a, a layer of moss that they have collected from the sides of trees. And then in that uh, layer of moss, they'll build a cup filled with uh, shed rabbit fur, Re neat little nests. Um, tree swallows, you know, if you have a bluebird house, you're expand with the uh, hole size uh, increasing, you're, you're increasing your potential to attract species. Um, you could have, your, of course, your bluebirds, wrens, uh, sparrows. Um, starlings in a, in a uh, circular hole, they can't get in, but if you have an uh, oval hole, they can kind of weave their way in. Um, <clears throat> but you might get tree swallows. They too have a really cool little nest. Again, the base of it is real fine grass, just like a bluebird. But then the cup in which they lay their eggs is made from molted waterfowl feathers. Um, in the spring of the year, when they, they're, they're, they, they're uh, associated with water areas, marshes, creeks, things like that. And uh, ducks and geese that will start molting or, or shedding their feathers is another term for it. 
um, they will collect those feathers and make a little cup. And, and they're very specific on what types of feathers they use. I've seen tree swallows use their cup uh, feathers made from all mallard hen feathers, all mallard drake feathers, all Canada goose feathers, all wood duck feathers, and they, they, they really are beautiful. So um, <clears throat> one interesting thing about, the again, biology, bluebirds will attempt to nest up to three times in a summer, and they can pull off three successful broods in a summer. So uh, if they initiate a nest in April, and say they have five uh, offspring, and those five uh, make it to flight stage, the parents will initiate another nest, their eggs, but then uh, not only will they feed the second brood, but the young from the first brood will help feed, uh, and so on. Um, not all bluebirds will pull off three successful broods. Um, tree swallows, on the other hand, have one time, one attempt to nest in the spring of the year. What they'll do is uh, initiate a nest in April or May. Once they come back, they'll lay, uh, build a nest, lay their clutch of eggs. If it gets predated, they're done for the year. So all reproductive efforts are, are th there's no reproduction, no uh, recruitment, new recruitment into the population for next year. So they've got a one shot at doing that. Wrens too will do uh, multiple nests in a year um, and chickadees one or two, so. Um, one of the little things about birdhouses, um, some people may ask um, about perches. Why don't you have a perch on the front of the box? You ever see a tree with a woodpecker hole with a perch in front of it? No, they don't need it. That's a human uh, uh, trait that's been attributed to it. And actually what it is, that's actually detrimental to your trying to help the birds too, because this is a perch for predatory birds like a blue jay. And the blue jays are just little crows. They're, they can be nasty little birds, beautiful as they are. They, that's all they are. They're a close cousin to crows. They'll sit on there and they'll, they'll, they'll give them, because they don't have the ability to hang on the side like uh, our cavity nesting birds and woodpeckers do. So you give them a perch, they'll be able to sit there and stick their head in there and get the, the eggs or the little ones. So, so we don't need perches on, on the front of the boxes. Um, what else? There's just so much to this all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like your yard in their own nest. If, bir if wrens were the size of a crow or a pheasant, I'd be afraid of them. They're nasty little birds. They got a beautiful song, but they are very territorial. Um, yeah, they will, they will poke holes in the eggs. Starlings, I've had, I don't know how many wood duck nests I've had initiated and they, before the hen will incubate. Um, starlings will get in there and they'll poke holes in the eggs um, and, and they'll run off. Uh, the wood ducks. I've had a, a wood duck nest, starling nest, wood duck nest, starling nest. Just the, the, the competition for fighting for that nest site is so fierce. So yeah, starlings, wrens too. They, they're very aggressive. Um, wrens are interesting in that the males will migrate north first in the year, establish a territory which can be an acre, two acres in size, and, and the male will go out and he'll search out every cavity within that territory that he wants to maintain, and he'll build a nest. And then once the females migrate back north, he will court her by taking to her to each site in which he has built a nest until she decides, okay, I like this one. Well, then she'll proceed in tearing that all apart and then rebuilding the nest on her own. So interesting behavior on, on wrens. So <laughs> um, like I said, there's just a ton of biology about every species um, and, and we're just limited to you know, a few here today. Um, it works best to work in partners when we start building your houses. Um, I've got the kits over on the uh, uh, side of the wall there. On the right are the wren kits. On the left are bluebirds. Um, take one of these with you. I only got two that show, and I'll uh, back up a minute here. I've got this one up here as an example. You know, all birdhouses don't need to look alike. Um, wrens have built nests in socks hanging on a clothesline in that short a period of time when they're wet, bring them out from the laundry, hang them up. They'll fill them up with sticks and they'll claim that as a nest site. So as long as the, the a site meets their minimum requirements uh, to build a nest with, with shelter either overhead or or uh, safety from predators or it's out of sight, something like that, they'll use it. Like I said, these little bitty wrens will use a nest box built for wood ducks. So we think. Um, so they don't all have to look alike. If you do take these home and paint them, this is just number two pine. Um, it's not real long, durable wood. I'd suggest slapping a coat of paint on it. 
If you got any leftover paint from a project you've had in the past, that'll work just fine. Color doesn't matter. I like to camouflage them, so to speak, make it look like tree bark. I mean, if you look out across the, the forest here behind us today, it's kind of that tan gray color. Um, you know, if you have something like that, that's fine. Um, if you want to decorate it, that's fine. If you want to paint flowers on it, do whatever you want. They'll, they'll find them, believe me. Um, you put yourself in, in, the, in the eyes of a bird and they do a lot of searching. Um, like today, um, yeah, you've got birds coming to your feeders, but if you look at them in the, in the middle of a forest, nuthatches and woodpeckers and chickadees and cardinals are looking at every nook and cranny in trees looking for an insect that decided to spend the winter there. Um, that's how they have to survive. So they do a lot of searching um, in the spring of the year uh, when wood ducks come back from, from uh, southern states. Uh, I've sat out in, in the forest turkey hunting, and I'll see a hen wood duck hopping from tree to tree to tree to tree to tree, to tree looking for a cavity to nest in. So, um, so if you want to paint them, that's fine. Um, they, they'll last longer. Um, this will teach you how to build houses um, first. If you want to take a set of plans uh, home, and it, it shows you all the dimensions that you need, um, do that to build more. Um, I've built several thousand boxes, combination of, of bluebird, wren, wood duck, um, one of the things, kind of a side note to, to show you about materials too, it doesn't have to look like a, a tree. Um, the wood duck nest boxes that we build, um, this was a style that was used for many, many years and it still is used uh, by a lot of people. But one thing we're using now is they're uh, <clears throat> 20, and you'll see them in the park areas that we have, uh, mounted on steel posts, again for predator proofing. But, uh, the 20 pound Freon cylinders that they use to recharge your air conditioners at your home and, and in your cars. Once those are empty, they can't refill them, so they just recycle them. And if we can intercept those, what we do is we chop the tops of them off, sandwich them together, cut a hole in it, hinge it, put a clasp on one side, and then what we'll do is, is uh, uh, on the inside, we'll pop rivet uh, hardware cloth uh, so that the little ones, once they hatch, are able to climb up and out. So we're using 20 pound Freon cylinders for most of our wood duck boxes now. Um, the birds that you're um, providing a nest for uh, have an incubation period of about two weeks and then a fledge time of about another two weeks. So they're in this box for about a month. Um, they're born blind, naked, with no feathers, um, which the scientific term for that is precocial. Um, so the parents will come and feed them. Wood ducks, pheasants, turkeys, on the other hand, once they hatch out, they're, they're, the scientific term for that is called altricial, which means they're born with their eyes open, uh, fully feathered and down, the little fuzzy chicks, just like a chicken hatching out. And they're in here about one day um, after they hatch, and then they climb up and out. Mom will call them, lead them to water if they're not already over water. So um, again, just a lot of trivial information, bird biology. So. Um, like I said, I just have two of these. Uh, grab one, uh, work in partners. I do have, there is a rhyme, I've, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. I've seen very, everywhere you can imagine on how to put these, the pieces of these together. Um, follow the instructions on, on your sheet there. Have somebody hold the boards together while you nail. Um, I do have them numbered, so number one, put that nail in first, two, three, four, and so on. Only put, on one side, only put a nail in the top um, uh, on that side, and then I'll drill a hole when you're done with it, and this is your key, your door lock. So that way, at this time of year, next year, you can open it up, clean last year's nest out, or the mice nest that may uh, have been built in there uh, through the years, or over the year too, so. So I guess with that, you got any questions? Anything about birds, I'm a bird nut. Not necessarily like you would for um, purple martins. Purple martins are a cavity nesting species also. They do need that wide open expanse to fly around because they, they do more gliding. Do, tree swallows are close, close second to that. Bluebirds, no, not so much. Um, again, don't just go and nail it to a tree. Um, don't get it close enough on an overhanging branch where a squirrel can jump, because squirrels don't just eat nuts. They'll search out little birds once in a while. Um, so no, they don't need that 
the expanse. Well, the at the edge of towns, if you're if you're on the edge and you have a larger yard, um, they can be at the, yeah they're around. Um, more the more centered you get into town, um, no. We have a crick in the back. Yep, sure. Um, you, you, if you got a crick, you could put up a wood duck box. Gu a guarantee. Duck. Yep, yeah. There's there. Every year. Inevitably every you year. Them out. Yep, we have a call. We have a call every year. Come in and say, I got these little ducks in my yard. What do you want us to do? Leave them alone. Um, wildlife calls, unless you know the mother's dead, just leave it alone. Um, leave it for 24 hours. Um, uh, mom wood duck probably got scared off and, and she'll come back and call and she'll lead them to water. Um, deer, uh, we are now, it's now illegal to come pick up deer and rehabilitate uh, fawns uh, because of chronic wasting disease. Um, you just got to let mother nature take its course on those. Um, it's not a human influenced disease, but because of the population, we don't want it to spread. Um, rehabilitators are, are now prohibited from moving deer. So, um, other questions? We're gonna make noise. We're gonna bend nails. I can pull them, no problem. Um, if your wood splits, I'll get you another piece. Um, have some fun. Okay. Okay. What do you, do you want to rent? Yeah, I did. I can go grab one. I got it. Popper bug here, which is made of foam, craft foam, and has rubber legs. This little fly uh, is a very good bluegill and crappie catcher. It also will work well uh, for trout. It, it, it must stimulate June bugs and uh, maybe a, a tadpole or a frog, something like that. But uh, it, it, it's a very good fish catcher and uh, it's easy to tie. So I'm using a, a size eight dry fly hook here. And uh, one of the first things you do is you lay a base of thread on the hook shank. And this uh, provides uh, something for the cement that we're going to be using to grab a hold of. So cut this tag off. Now uh, we will make our body out of this foam, which is about a little over a quarter of an inch wide. I trim it to give us a point. But to make the body stick without turning, I'm going to use just a little super glue here. And that'll help us set the foam. 
So I wind back over the phone. So now I've created the underbody. I bring my thread back about a quarter of the way and pull the material back over itself and pinch it here and take a couple of fairly loose wraps. Now, now we have created the body part of the bug and now we're going to put a little piece of contracting foam on here so that when the, the bug is on the water we'll be able to see So I'm going to trim it so that it'll push some water when it goes on the water so that it'll push water and create noise. I'm going to bring the thread back to where we did our tie-in and add some legs. Legging material called uh, Silly leg material. It's made in all sorts of colors. And we have a length of this material. We'll cut it in two. going to put our legs on. We'll have a pair of legs on each side here. In a minute. Okay, well now we're going to put the other leg on. So now we have our bug. We've got the, the body, the thorax. We have the legs, just these legs a little bit. Now we're gonna finish the fly by a few wraps behind the hook eye. And then we'll put a couple of half hitches up in here. This is called a whip finish. Now we can adjust the legs here a little bit, down just a little bit. So here's our finished bug, and uh, we're going to put just a die, a little bit of cement, which is nail polish. This will cement the legs in place. So now we've got a finished bug and uh, it's a fish catcher it's a very very good lure works well around here at local farm ponds uh, sand lake would be a perfect place to use this green castle would be a perfect place to use this so there's a example of a foam Crappie, bluegill, bass, trout. Oh.